Good morning, everyone. It is said that C.S. Lewis kept an image of the Shrouded Torum by his bedside. That way, he always knew the face of God. This struck me, and I, too, have always kept an image of Yeshua from the Shroud in my studio. That way, I know his true face as well. Anyway, I am filming this video in my studio instead of out on a trail because there is a lot of science and names to get to and I don't want to gargle my words or screw them up too badly for you as I read through my notes. So with that, let's delve into The Shroud of Torn, Fact or Fiction. Before we can jump into the scientific study of The Shroud of Torn, we first need to discover the documented history of The Shroud which dates as far back as 1354, when it was first exhibited in the New Collegial Church of Livry, a village in north-central France. Then, in 1389, the shroud was denounced as a forgery by the Bishop of Troyes, Pierre d'Arsis. Next, it was acquired by the House of Savoy in 1453, and later deposited in the Chapel of Chambry, where it was unfortunately damaged by a fire in 1532. The Savoys then moved the Shroud to their new capital, Turin, in 1578, where it has remained ever since, with the Chapel of the Holy Shroud becoming the religious artifact's final home in 1683. But it wasn't until 1983, with the death of King Umberto II, that ownership of the Shroud passed from the House of Savoy to the Catholic Church. Moving back in time, in 1898, a photo taken by Secondo Paya, changed everything when the negative of the image was reviewed. Now in black and white, the image of a roughly 5 foot 10 male with shoulder length hair and a beard whose face and body were covered in blood was as clear as day. Reviewing the negative, the signs of this man's torture were evidence on his back, chest, and legs, which have over a hundred minor round wounds less than an inch in size, caused by tearing and subcutaneous bleeding. These numerous injuries appeared to have been caused by the intentional flogging from two separate Roman flagrums, which is a wooden stick with multiple strings that are tipped with barbell-shaped metal ends. Another sign of injury is found in the bruising of his shoulder blades, which indicates that he must have carried something extremely heavy upon his shoulders prior to his death as well. Possibly, like the wooden cross, Yeshua is said to have carried to Golgotha. Now, it was indeed common practice for the Romans to have the condemned carry their own cross to their ultimate fate. Now let's jump into the scientific study of the Shroud. Between 1969 and 1973, the 11 member Turing Commission was formed to advise on the best preservation methods to preserve the shroud from the ravages of time. But it wasn't until 1976 when physicist John P. Jackson, thermodynamicist Eric Jumper, and photographer William Morton used image analysis technologies developed by the aerospace industry to begin analyzing the image on the shroud. Then, in 1977, these three, along with over 30 other experts, from various fields form the Shroud of Torn Research Project. As I am not someone who is agenda-driven, I am about to give both sides of, to a controversial topic regarding the Shroud. In October 1978, 32 samples were taken from the Shroud using adhesive tape, 18 of which were directly taken from the image of the tortured man. Walter McCrone, who was a leading expert in the forensic authentication of historical documents, examined the samples, and concluded the image was basically painted on with iron oxide, food coloring, and that the blood stains were highlighted with vermilion. These claims were mostly rejected by other team members, other than John Heller and Alan Alder, as the samples acted like organic materials under a laser. This was something that iron oxide was not capable of doing. In other words, the iron found on the shroud was not the source of the image. Plus, Macron also claimed that no actual blood was present on the shroud. Remember this point, as later it will become extremely valuable in judging Macron's credibility. Anyway, in 1980, Macron resigned from the research 
team and surrendered all tape samples he had in his possession. Skipping ahead to 1988 and the elephant in the room, a team comprised of individuals from the University of Oxford, the University of Arizona, and the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology performed a radiocarbon dating test from a small corner taken from the shroud. They concluded with what they claimed to be 95% confidence that the shroud dated to sometime between 1260 and 1390 AD. This date uncannily matches up with the first appearance in the documentation of the shroud in church history. Now, if you were to look this up on something like Wikipedia, which as we all know is entirely agenda-driven when it comes to religious or political issues, you would believe that the case was closed and that the following piece of information I am about to give doesn't hold water. However, the following piece of evidence completely debunks the debunkers. The corner they took their sample from was the repaired corner from the fire that occurred in 1532. So with that, I would say their test has pretty much all but been discredited. However, with that said, the church, possibly out of fear of a later dating or damage to the shroud, has not allowed a sample to be taken from the image itself for another radiocarbon dating test. Before we can get to the new modern day dating test that just took place with shocking conclusions, let's cover the blood, which was initially believed to be vermilion, as you may remember. We have already discussed the adhesive tape tests, but other more scientific tests, such as a series of chemical and immunologist tests were conducted by Italian surgeon, Dr. Pier Luigi Alone on the supposed blood stains. I hope I said his name right. I am Italian, but it's very hard. Now, considering none of us here are immunologists, I will avoid covering all the technical terms. As first, I can't even pronounce most of them. And second, I don't want to bore you with me attempting to sound out 20 plus letter words. But the conclusion of his findings was there was indeed blood. However, there was more so much more. The blood itself was considerably more dense than normal blood, meaning the man wrapped in the shroud was dehydrated at the time of his death and also had high levels of beryllium. <laughs> beryllium? I think that's how you say it, which was found in the samples. This is a telltale sign the man was tortured prior to his demise. Plus, he was able to extract a blood type of AB, which, as we all know, is extremely rare. Suppose we dive into the rabbit hole of conspiracy. In that case, some have claimed that even contaminated DNA samples were recovered as well, but then hidden away by the Catholic Church. Considering this video is only meant to cover the hard evidence and not an unproven conspiracy, no matter my personal views, we will leave this rabbit hole behind with just a peek inside. But before we move on, there is one other compelling piece of evidence regarding the blood. Unlike what we see when we look at a Catholic crucifix, on the shroud, the blood stains from the nails used to hold the man to the cross are found in the wrists and not the hands. At the time that it was claimed that the shroud was created in Europe, the artist would not have known to paint these wounds there because nailing through the hands would not have supported the man's weight. This fact of the placement of the nails through the wrists has only become known to science and religious scholars in modern times. Now, let's cover something that most avoid discussing as evidence regarding the origins of the shroud. First, the shroud is made of flax, common to the Middle East and not Europe. This was also backed up by isotope tests on the fibers that proved the flax was indeed grown in the Middle East. I would say the case is closed on the shroud being a medieval forgery, but there is even more evidence against this theory. Next, there were many pollen grains found on the shroud that are native to Jerusalem and nowhere in Europe. Again, 
This makes it impossible to be a medieval European forgery. Plus, the grains come from flowers that would be blooming in the spring, which is the time of Passover and the time Yeshua was said to be crucified. So yes, this may be considered circumstantial evidence. However, along with the rest of the evidence discussed, there really is no doubt that the shroud came from the Middle East, if not Jerusalem, and was exposed to the air at some time around Passover. Now that we know the blood on the shroud is in fact authentic, and it did originate in Jerusalem, the next question is, when? When was it actually used? Well, in this year, in 2024, a new technology using the power of x-rays is finally answering that question, and it is sending shockwaves through the scientific community that is not blinded by their own dogma and beliefs. A research team from Italy's Institute of Crystallography applied a technique called wide-angle x-ray scattering to date the shroud. The way this method works is by analyzing the measurable breakdown rate of flax cellulose. It seems to be a bit like radiocarbon dating, but more accurate because plants degenerate at a faster pace than carbon, allowing for a more accurate timetable. Anyway, adding into the equation that the shroud was kept at a temperature of around 72.5 degrees Fahrenheit in an area that averages a 55% relative humidity rate for roughly 13 centuries before it arrived in Europe, they found that the shroud dates to some time between, wait for it, 55 and 74 AD. Considering that we are talking about something from 2,000 years ago and allowing for unknown veritables over these years, this lines up almost perfectly with the biblical date of 33 AD. Case closed. Unlike the team that took a small sample from the repaired corner of the shroud in 1988, this team examined eight small samples from all over the shroud all of which were consistent with that date. To validate their findings, they tested other known samples that dated between the same time and originated from the same area, such as a piece of flax linen known to have come from one of Herod's fortresses along the shores of the Dead Sea. And yes, the shroud matched up with all the control samples, but no samples that were tested from European linens originating from the medieval period. The final question surrounding the shroud, now that we know it is authentic, is how the image was created. This is definitely a million dollar question. There is no plausible answer. I, for one, believe the image was created from, quite possibly, the burst of energy, such as ultraviolet radiation, which may have occurred during the resurrection. Some may believe otherwise, but this is all conjecture. Even my answer to the stain that makes up the body of the crucified man on the cloth. So is the Shroud of Turin the cloth that Joseph of Arimathea wrapped Yeshua's body in according to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, verse 59 and 60, or the burial shroud of someone else? Well, unless you have a time machine, we will have to take it on faith that it is. I, for one, believe that it is, in fact, Yeshua's burial shroud. And when you look at the face found in the flax linen, you, indeed, are looking at the man who changed history. Well, I hope you liked that. I think I made it through with very limited errors. If you like what I'm doing, please like and subscribe to my channel. It's going to be a lot of self-help and enlightenment type stuff. I'm just getting started. If you really want to help support me, there are links for some of the books that I've written down below. They're available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, but enough of the self-promotion. Otherwise, I'll talk to you again soon with another video. Bye.